Uh, good evening. I'm very happy to the museum and I'd like to welcome all of you for joining us today for this very special talk by Dr. Parul Dhaven Mukherjee. Uh, just to tell you briefly, Dr. Parul Dhaven Mukherjee is a professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics at JNU in New Delhi. Uh, before that, she was also a professor at uh, Baroda School of Fine Art Fine Arts School. And uh, she holds a PhD in Indology from Oxford University. She has published widely, she's been part of seminars, lectures, and today she's presenting this uh, very fascinating topic uh, called Why Have There Been No Gorilla Girls in Indian Art? So, without any delay, I'm uh, Yeah, thank you, uh, Pooja, for that introduction. And um, I, um, I'm very gratified to see presence of some men today for the talk. Uh, because usually when we talk about feminism and gender issues, it's assumed that it's only men for women, which is not the point at all. Uh, so just briefly, how I got interested in this topic, uh, it was, of course, um, this paper is uh, originally a review of Kochi Biennale, and then I've converted that into a, a talk for this evening. Um, so, yes, the, the title is Why There Have Been No Gorilla Girls in Indian Art. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you too much about my main argument. Um, Agenda of Kochi Biennale. 2018. So that's a subtitle. Um, try typing curating as a man and curating as a woman on Google search and two opposite worlds pop up. The first takes you to the world of haute couture inhabited by fashionable men where it is not they who wear the suits but it is the suits that wear them. Curating as a woman on the other hand, takes you towards a serious journey through the thickets of, of heavy feminist discourse, punctuated by ponderings about exclusion, erasure, and the demands of the emancipatory. The contrast between the light curating and the heavy kinds of curating around gender difference, that this search machine signals, leaks the contradiction of the current neoliberalism in very real terms. Ironically, it is the curator as a man who best betrays alienation that the curator of 2018 Kochi Biennale, Anita Dube, foregrounded in her concept note on the possibility for a non-alienated life. Alienation springs from the inequalities of the late capitalist world which have spread the tentacles globally, but in the world of high fashion, the power relations are inverted. In fact, in this upside down world of spectacle, even race is capitalized upon. Black men are shown as sporting a designer wear and flaunting it across Florence, Vienna, Paris, and all. Capitalism is at its neurotic best hiding his contradictions, and in fact, turning the very contradiction into yet another saleable commodity. The very order of the world that Guy Debord, the famous French uh, philosopher, uh, mocked at in his famous book called The Society of the Spectacle, flourishes in different guises today, unabashedly, while our planet appears to be whirling deeper and deeper into an ecological black hole. This is indeed a time for lamentation and confrontation of the stubborn and relentless resilience of the exploitative structures of global capitalism. Even if both the society and the art world have outlived divorce model. So this is uh, the ironical part of it, where I mean, if you read the entire concept note by Anita Dube, the curator of Kochi Biennale, the recent Kochi Biennale, uh, she draws a lot in a very first line of a concept note. If you, those of you who visited Kochi Biennale would have remembered that she draws from Guy Debord. So it's ironical that that very model we've already outlived. 
But what does it all mean from our location in the global south, where all kinds of marginalities crisscross and thrive? With Dubey's claim, this is her claim, that we're, we're all in this mess together, those are her words, even the distinction between the global north and global south become facile. This mess is a complete and complex tangle of many marginalities, as you can see, arising from class, gender, caste, religion, race, sexuality, and you can go on adding them. What then turns out to be a daunting question is how do these complex coordinates of power shape one another? In some cases, gender zooms to the foreground, in others, race and class intertwine, and yet in others, it can be sexuality, caste, and so on. Does this Biennale make us sit with a checklist of the shifting equations of inequalities and the endless permutations that block a way to a non-alienated life? The Biennale takes on the challenge of combining pedagogy and pleasure, and this is also part of the concept of the curator. So where she says that she really wants to see if she can be at the same time didactic, at the same time, you know, also, you know, be very, very, uh, like, uh, punchy about some of the political uh, contradictions. Yet, yet a heaviness hangs in the air. And this is my personal response when I went to Kochi Biennale, that there was a sense of this heaviness. And it is this heaviness that I will address both as a phenomenological affect and a discursive effect. When I enter the venues of Kochi Biennale, Aspen Hall, Pepper House, David Hall and all, it was hard not to think of the gender of the artistic director of a Biennale of the Global South. Women curators are a rare event, even in many of the Biennales and the documentas of the Global North. And there are just a handful of names. Catherine David, Christine Marcel. It was in 1997 when Catherine David curated Documenta 10, a fact that the press continually highlighted, much to the irritation of David. So grappling with my own dilemma over the issue of gender in curating, I could not help asking this question to David. I met her in Delhi recently. If she too had faced this inevitable gender question, of course she did. And the an answer in 1997 was that at 40, a gender change was out of question and the audience better live with who she was. Imagine if the previous curators of Kochi Biennale were asked whether their gender came into play in their curatorial frameworks. Was gender just a superfluity that could simply be shrugged off by male curators who had the prerogative to focus on unmarked concerns like poetics, the future of the planet, or simply celebration of a new Biennale location in a global south? When women curators mock at being identified by the gender, is it fair to use this as a frame to view the Kochi Biennale of 2018? It is very clear from the concept note of this Biennale that gender is one of the many frames that goes into exploring the possibilities for a non-alienated life. In case of Dubey, both gender and region of Kerala assume salience, given a key role that she played in the manifesto around the Indian Radical Painters and Sculptors Association, which also is referred to often as Kerala Radical Group, which came together in 1987, and it was Dubey who actually wrote the manifesto for this group. So in her own artistic practice that emerged subsequently, so it's very interesting, uh, Dubey was actually a student of art criticism in Baroda, and then later on she turned to art practice. And then, of course, she turned to a very specific kind of art practice with a very strong tilt towards the conceptual. So she actually used her background in art criticism to great advantage. So in her own practice, Dubey had seldom priced away gender from other power relationships and maintained attention on poetics of material, you may point out. So why am I just looking at gender then in this case? I will still persist with my gender question as a heuristic or perhaps as, as a strategic essentialist move to unpack some of Dubey's curatorial decisions. Gender issues in the context of the Marxist legacy in Kerala have fraught ramifications. 
even in Marx's own writings on alienation, gender hardly featured, paving the way for the Marxist common sense that once class is addressed, gender inequality will automatically be redressed. In this light, foregrounding gender is less to do with essentializing the curator of this year's Kochi Biennale than an assertion that no political analysis is meaningful if it overlooks the category of gender. Okay, so let us start with the most upfront nod to the feminist discourse in art history by the curator. Of all feminist movements in art history, it is Guerrilla Girls which is prominently signposted at this Biennale. Now this women's collective was formed in 1985 to protest against women artists' exclusion from 1984 MoMA exhibition in New York. And in their practice, the Guerrilla Girls gave expression to the feminist anger at women's systematic exclusion from Western art institutions and canon. They mixed fierce images with piercing words to confront West blindness to gender oppression in their iconic posters. The turn to this feminist collective, once a force of subversion, but now written into the mainstream feminist art history, is a statement in itself. Does its inclusion at this Kochi Biennale gesture back to previous editions of this Biennale, which the earlier two or three, whose founding curators also faced the criticism of underrepresentation of women artists? In fact, what's interesting is at last Kochi Biennale, I think uh, Dubey was very, very attentive to this fact, and I think in terms of gender ratio, it was almost 50-50. This curatorial move by Dubey at once invites a charge of anachronism. Why did she turn now to the guerrilla girls who were shaped by 1970s feminism? How does a feminist collective that arose in 1985 speak to the feminist discourse of 2018? Surely Dubey with her interest in our activism and politics of representation had made this choice after careful deliberation. Are any of the questions about women's artists' exclusion from the art institution raised by the guerrilla girls not pertinent today in 2018, 2019? Relevant that this critic may be of objecting to curators' turn to the 1970s feminism, it can also become facile if we view feminism from the lens of teleology of progress whose most objectionable logic has spawned, at least to me, a ridiculous term called post-feminism. Post-feminism implies that the question of gender disparity is a thing of the past, and the modernist project has concluded successfully for women that they have full political representation, they work in a safe workspace, rapes and sexual harassment are obsolete, and women have now emerged as full citizens in the global world. <coughs> Have we really moved on? Perhaps we have moved on somewhat in the art world since more than a decade. Women artists' visibility in galleries, museums is no longer an issue. They are being written into art history and monographs on women artists are in circulation and many of whom are already canonized. Yet many inconsistencies remain. Most glaring is that even as of now, many women artists shy away from being called feminists. Here, a sharp contrast, at least for me, I, I can see between Western and Indian feminism, which kind of stares us at the face. In the West, there was a close alliance between women artists, art historians, and women's movements. I have in mind artists like Perry Kelly, art historian like Griselda Pollock, and all. Something that had either been missing or remained tenuous, or in Indian context, acknowledged post facto in India. Look at how Dubey's curatorial engagement with guerrilla girls um, makes feminism newly relevant and irrelevant at the same time. So, um, the artists from this group, guerrilla girls, they were sort of commissioned to create fresh works for this Biennale. So they made new works, but if you look at the works, they appear largely to carry their own North American context. The Gorilla Girls' presence at Kochi had a potentiality 
for opening a new conversation between the feminism of the North and South, but this was foreclosed by their unfamiliarity with the local context. In fact, they performed at the pavilion soon after the opening of Biennale, which unwittingly turned out to be a hospitable site for the Me Too protest, which has lately been rocking the Indian art world. Quite different from the agenda of the guerrilla girls who highlighted women's struggle to enter art institutions, the Me Too movement brought to the fore sexual harassment that many young women in the art world have always been vulnerable to. In fact, it is possible to see connections across the agenda as the unequal power structures of the art world that guerrilla girls critiqued are precisely the conditions that renders young women artists or art assistants or gallery personnel vulnerable to exploitations by men. It is apparent that the millennial women open to social media are not going to silently suffer and will in fact, de will in fact deploy the very media to expose abuse of power. With the kind of legal structures in the country, with its dismal track record, the young feminists took recourse to the tactic of naming and shaming powerful men, a move that has been a point of contention between the older and the younger feminists. The cracks within Indian feminism is visible in the wake of Me Too movement and the Dalit women's critique of what they perceive as elite, fem elite feminism has to uh, I'm just quoting Roy's work, words, paved the way for a more intersectional and self-reflexive feminist politics and practice, unquote. So, um, so this is the, a new interesting event which kind of broke out at the performance by Gorilla Girls uh, when um, I think the mic was actually taken by uh, those who were part of the, uh, the movement and then they began to uh, talk about these issues and to, to utter uh, consternation and surprise of the guerrilla girls because they had no idea of the, con the local context, so to speak. Now, such a situation creates an anomaly of concerns across the guerrilla girls and women protesters because the former came across as caught off guard and unfamiliar with the local concerns, or the latter is viewed as a blank slate on which guerrilla girls inscribe their feminism. So the idea was, do they just come, see, perform, and leave? Or is there a possibility of a, of a dialogue? Rather than debunking the presence of guerrilla girls at this Biennale, let us take it as a provocation for raising further questions to defamiliarize Indian art historiography. And to raise a couple of these questions, the first one, uh, it's after Linda Nochlin, um, famous American art historian who, who raised this very, very political question in, I think, 1971. Uh, she asked this question, why have there been no great women artists? So I'm just taking off from there and asking the questions, why have there been no Indian guerrilla girls before? Or the second question, which is after Geeta Kapoor's celebrated book, When Was Modernism? So I'm asking the question, when was feminism in modern Indian art? The first question, if you go back to the question, why have there been no Indian guerrilla girls before, leads us to the route taken by uh, Linda Nocklin, who famously asked this question in 1971 about the absence of great women artists. Being the most productive feminist question of the last century, it opened the debates about the politics of canonization and the discourse of greatness that has naturalized women's inferiority in terms of lacking the phallic nugget of genius. It led to tremendous archival research and sociological study of the past institutions of art and their modes of exclusion. It led to the groundwork that created conditions for the guerrilla girls to systematically counter the MoMA misogyny through an exhibition and through the form formation of the collective itself. We need to go to the previous one. What role can the guerrilla girls play in India where the debates have a different starting point? The very term guerrilla girls that underwrites the grotesque and anonymity, because most of the, I mean, it's part of the practice that they never appear in public place, uh, you know, without a mask. So they believe in anonymity as part of their strategy. 
So the very term guerrilla girls that underwrites the grotesque and anonymity has a different implication for the subcontinent with its history of colonial past, which had provoked the art historian Partha Mitter to write his now very famous book, Much Maligned Monsters, 1977. Even anonymity, which has a political edge for guerrilla girls, had a different valence in South Asian art history. If we recall pioneering art historian Ananda Kumaraswamy's continual bid for non anonymity, he used anonymity as a strategy to get back to the West, saying that you know, we don't celebrate uh, you know, the idea of genius and masters and so on, because here in India, the craftsman you know, who works um, without seeking uh, fame and so on uh, is, is, is a celebrated figure. So for Kumar Swami, anonymity was seen as a decolonizing strategy to critique West celebration of individuality in art. What for the guerrilla girls served to challenge West blindness to race via the, the trope of monster and ruptured the myth of male artists as an individual genius via anonymity had come to acquire new meaning in post-colonial India. In India, anonymity has be, be, now become a contested site for socially marginalized artists, such that biography is being reinstated to give recognition to folk and tribal artists. I mean, for example, a very famous exhibition uh, curated by Jyotin the Jain, um, which was called, uh, uh, I think it's on Unknown Masters, Unknown Masters, where, which, what was the exact title? Uh, so he, there's, there's a take on the word masters. So what he wants to do is, is he wants to apply notions of the master to the so-called anonymous folk artist as a strategy to give visibility to somebody who has always been hugely exploited. Oh yes, other masters, other masters. It's a very interesting play on the word other and masters. From the perspective of these artists, that is folk and tribal artists, who have been written out of history, it is the mask of anonymity thrust upon them, which has to be wrenched open as a way to lay claim to full citizenship via subjectivity. The second question alludes to Gita Kapoor's authoritative book on when was modernism in Indian art. In Kapoor's writings, which span a wide range of concerns from the Indian modern, Gender enters the frame belatedly. It's quite interesting that uh, if you notice, uh, uh, I mean, if you go through history of her ideas, uh, uh, the way in which she published articles, it's not before nine, uh, 2000 that she frontally engages with the category of gender. Hmm? So that's why I write, gender enters the frame belatedly. However, in this anthology of essays, 2000, when was modernism in Indian art produced, which was a set of essays which were produced over a period of time, the belatedness is redressed by placing the essay on gender as the opening chapter. As it works with the category of gender, it, once, uh, it at once offers comparative feminism as a possible framework within which paintings by Amrita Shargil and Frida Kahlo, for example, they enter into a dialogue. A more concerted look at gender has had been taken up by Gayatri Sinha. She's another important art critic who has worked on gender. In 1996, she brought out a very interesting special mark volume called Expressions and Evocations, Contemporary Women Artists of India, which marked an important moment in feminist art historiography. It plots the significant contribution of women artists of 20th century while underlining the need to archive their uh, histories and practices. But the absence of guerrilla girls' moment in Indian art historiography still persists. Neither strong claims of exclusion from the canon nor fierce claims of politics of representation is part of their narratives, as both Kapoor and Sinha remain within the class context that these women artists came from. The struggles of these women artists are seen less inst as institutional than as personal. So is my question about why there have been no guerrilla girls in Indian art falling into the bind of a derivative discourse? Is Indian art historiography supposed to mirror trends in Western art history? 
No. My question is more used as a provocation to interrogate absence of a certain politics of representation in India and to further ask, do the guerrilla girls enter into a dialogue with feminism as it emerged in this part of the world? Or do they come to Kochi Biennale, perform and leave? The closest parallel to this mode of strident feminism is not to be found in the Indian art world, but within women's civil rights movement. The recent Sabrimala activism in Kerala that centered around women's access to a temple that for centuries was open only to men. Religion emerges as a sphere of feminist activism in which claims of access to at the temple amounts to claims of secular citizenship. So for them to constantly fight for entry into temple was not just to enter into the temple. It was also to prove that they are equal citizens, uh, you know, as um, having equal citizen rights. If Gurla girls were seeking access to the museums as temples of art in 1980s, the Sabri Mala temple activists are asserting their right to enter an actual temple. The absence of guerrilla girls in Indian art history is itself a productive provocation. The Indian modern, with its secularist framework, drew a sharp line between temples of art and temples of worship. The conditions of guerrilla girls were missing in India, given the post-colonial nature of early institutions that thrive on state patronage. Where nationalism was the overcoming framework and Nehruvian socialism tended to recognize class over gender and even over caste, which is why the whole Mandal Commission, which happens, is kind of return of the repressed. The stamp of nationalism on popular visual culture is most evident in posters or calendars featuring Bharat Mata or Mother India. Its gender politics, a creation of male imagination, saw no threat from women as long as they were locked in allegories and placed outside history. And once India gained freedom from the colonial rule, women who were once at the forefront of nationalism or nationalist struggle were now expected to return to the domestic fold and the larger patriarchal order remained undisturbed. When we look back, the closest parallel to an early collective of women artists may be found in the famous, now the famous looking glass exhibition of 1987. In the place of Gorilla Girls, we have a spectrum of women artists ranging from Madhavi Parikh, Nilima Sheikh, Arpita Singh, Nalini Malani, who had formed a loose affiliation in late 1980s. It was an inaugural moment for Indian feminism, even if Ashirada Dhyaksha, the male critic, who wrote on this show, was reluctant to even use the term feminism. The male critics may have been voicing the apprehension felt by some women artists that the foregrounding of gender risks, risks being bracketed from the mainstream. And perhaps it was thought, meant to be a kind of a strategy, because he felt that if, if gender, gender is foregrounded, then they will be kind of ghettoized. The upfront manifesto and virulent institutional critique associated with the American Gorilla Girls appears to be displaced onto another site in the Indian art world. And it comes up in the late 1980s with the formation of the Kerala Radical Group. Of this group, uh, it was Ganita Dubey who actually wrote a manifesto. This is quite interesting. Even the gender politics are very complicated. It was none other than Dubey who wrote the manifesto and emerged as the most vociferous voice of this leftist group. Of this leftist group. So you have Krishna Kumar uh, in the foreground, who was kind of the leader of the group, and other members of the Kerala radical group. Prabhakaran can be seen, others can be seen. <clears throat> but way back in 1980s, late 1980s, on the eve of Indian economy's liberalization, and the global collapse of socialism, this strident manifesto ended up prioritizing class over gender. And if you read the manifesto today, in Dubey's strong critique of the art world and his capitalist complicity, she comes heavily on all the <laughs> important stalwarts of the art world, you know, aligning them with um, kind of this whole capitalist uh, complicity and so on. Feminism came in the line of fire 
and was pushed to the realm of kitsch, irrelevant at best and postmodern at worst. So this, these are the terms uh, through which uh, feminism was actually ridiculed, ridiculed by Anita Dubey in the manifesto. Feminism and postmodernism were aligned and painted with the same brush. So this is the uh, title of, of the uh, Radical Manifesto, Kerala Radical Manifesto, it's what is called Questions and Dialogue. And I remember 1987, it was a huge event in Baroda where they really took on the establishment. The upfront manifesto and the virul virulent institutional critique associated with the American guerrilla group. I'm sorry, I think I've moved. I have moved a bit. Ah. Appears to be displaced onto the uh, onto another site in the Indian art world. The form formation of Kerala radical group. Okay. okay so, yeah. at the fourth Koshi Biennale, Dubey fills this lacuna and redresses the folly of this history. Perhaps it is here that her anachronistic move towards Gorilla Girls may find legibility. From the side of the artist, it is the Polish artist, Goshka Makuga, printed tapestry, You Made Me a Communist, which pays a transcultural homage to women intellectuals and Marxist activists of Kerala. So you have all these, you can't see very clearly, but all the major uh, Kerala women activists, they are placed within the landscape. Hmm? And it is Karl Marx's tomb that travels to their land in a belated reckoning of their overlooked history. At such moments, heaviness lifts and pedagogy and pleasure join hands to reflect on a non-alienated life. Thank you. And I can, we can have discussion and questions. I hope I have provoked into asking many questions. Uh, I mean, I have to frame the question uh, perfectly in my mind, but I was wondering whether, even for uh, curators, artists, or uh, academics, uh, to respond to an event like this uh, Me Too event happened this year. Uh, to respond to it immediately is difficult. It takes a few, sure. it takes some time. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt like, I mean, I, I visited uh, the exhibition, I felt like it, this was in a way an attempt to engage with what was happening without doing it sort of head on. Uh, so also to, to bring in this Gorilla Girl then became a way to uh, his, to, to historicize feminism and sort of this radical feminism that's uh, happening now on social media but without doing it uh, overtly also I was wondering whether it was uh, not doing it overtly um, to respect the previous uh, like like no. we asked for more whatever you know it was to re respect the previous uh, Koshi Pianales the Koshi Pianale, yeah I mean I just I just wondered whether it was a way to uh, Tackle it without sort of being to break it gently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But what I was troubled by was the lack of consideration of a dialogic space. You know, and the, it made the whole thing very one-sided. So had it not been for this unexpected outburst of the whole Me Too movement, which is really, actually, I was told it was very spontaneous. And then it completely took over. And it actually left those very people who were, part, who were centrally in, invited to be part of that event. Sure. Yeah, so they, they some kind of, you know, step back and say, like, what's happening? Let's try to understand. So that was an important moment for me, yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, good evening. I am Parija. I am sorry I came late so I missed most of the presentation. But I have a question. Uh, this presentation it deals with uh, the women empowerment. Okay. Uh, the way in which uh, women are being uh, treated in the field of art, art especially. especially. Okay. But uh, what I believe is that, and I would like your views on that, 
true empowerment cannot come unless the balance of power is established. If we talk in, uh, in terms of India, we have got uh, at least three women ministers who are holding very important position. Ministers? The, ministers, yeah, central government ministers. But the fact is that they do not have the real power. For that matter, none of the ministers have real power in India. And especially if you see the recent uh, events where Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice has been uh, accused of a uh, sexual harassment case and the, the way they have uh, tried to tackle this or mistackle this uh, thing Mis -tackle. Has, yeah, has sent a very very wrong message to the public because if people, it is all about power women are being exploited because somebody who is harassing them is in position of power so that he can harm him her in another way also and here when they got a chance to set an example they faltered very badly so don't you think that all talks remains just talk unless something is done even even the fact that two ladies were part of that panel which has given this absurd clean chit i'll tell you one thing for us to understand gender as a political category it's very important to separate it from biological category of a woman because the, one of the reasons why patriarchy has remained such a formidable force even till today is because very often it takes the form of a woman it can it can women can occupy places just because they are biologically they are women does not necessarily make them feminists they can also be used as, as a stooge you see so i think that it's very important for us to understand that so uh, it's not that you know we, of course one can be proud that you know finally uh, we have a defense minister in yes, form yes, of we are so much proud that but but we still have to deal with what are the politics that they are standing for this kind of a you know blatant nationalism that kind of nationalism can never serve the interest of a woman you know it's always for a certain kind of mindless a show of masculinity right so they are being used as a facade basically? Of course, of course, absolutely. Which is why, you see, uh, for me, a um, lot of people very, very uh, simplistically say that the first woman artist is, guess who? Shari. 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 I, I, I refuse to go by that logic. Just because she is woman, biologically woman, does not necessarily make her the first feminist artist. Feminism has to come from a certain intent, right? Not just by your biological gender. Um, I mean, there's a lot to debate about. Sure. And the voice is not right. Uh, I thank you for the presentation. Basically, uh, bringing the focus on to feminism. And for long, we have been part of the feminist movement. And there have been constant debates because the way we look at feminism in India, from, and from a cultural point of view, has to be understood first. You cannot adapt uh, to Western feminism. And after our work of so many years, in fact, during the 1992, during the time of the rise of the right wing, mm -hmm. rise of fundamentalism, all this, we had brought out a paper called Why the, why the Fascists Have the Women mm -hmm. and the Feminists at the Moment. Okay, so this is only to typically say that for very long we, including me, including us, have avoided or not looked at as a caste question as very much a basis of the gender question Absolutely. and the patriarchy, the rise of patriarchy. Absolutely. So in that context, um, it makes me wonder whether uh, and makes me wonder why, of course, to movement all this is leaving aside. But it makes me wonder whether it is because of that that guerrilla girls will not get a kind of, will not be able to uh, sink into the milieu of our society. And a lot of our, whatever we say, feminist thinking is unfortunately not taking into, not taking into equation the, uh, the cultural way it has been built up way women have been socialized, mm -hmm. the way women have internalized the Absolutely. patriarchy and Absolutely. the entire, you know, the way it is going on. So, uh, we can talk of at one level, mm -hmm. at the middle class level, at the educated mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. but when we are working with the Dalits and we are working with the people,
people at we see a different kind of feminism. And I don't mean the word word feminism, but we see different ways in which women are becoming feminists without being acknowledged outside. I just like to end by saying that I don't know if it has any relevance here, but you know if you have read that uh, book. Uh, the, the Ramayana told differently mm -hmm. by the Gond artists. Mm -hmm. And you see that Gond, the Gond artists basically uh, tra drawing out the, through their artistry, which is that work of you know using those many colors mm -hmm. and that kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, figures are very large. Mm -hmm. You know, the peacock mm -hmm. is a large yeah, 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 yeah. things like that. The imagery is very large. Mm -hmm. So that reveals the actual. Mm -hmm. That that reveals the actual uh, cultural manifestation of art. I mean, the art that is coming from their own lives and their own perceptions. So in that art, and if you see their relationship to also what we have as a guerrilla movement in our country. You know, we have in the tribals, in the forests, in the universities. We have this coming up because it is natural. Probably what is happening now as torture on them. So I just like to say that that art is not represented anymore. Absolutely. Anywhere. So art has largely been a kind of middle class yeah. movement, unfortunately. And I think right now the, the important lesson that Indian feminists have to learn is from the Dalit critique, which is very strident and should really make us sit up and question our own privileges, which creates blind spots. You know, we are blind to our own privileges and then, you know, we uh, make the gesture of representing all. In fact, similar question happened when um, um, there was this, after Western feminist movement, which kind of became a very important discourse. And then uh, the, the, the very nice critique, interesting critique by Chandra Talpare Mohanty through Western, uh, through Indian, uh, no, through brown eyes, where she offers such a powerful critique of Euro-American feminism, which made them sit up. So I think it's very important to keep that kind of a dialogue going. And, and this discourse has to be kind of constantly argued out. And one has to keep the criticality alive. One can never reach a point saying that, oh, we've done our bit, now we can sit back and relax. It because the kind of formidable force that we are confronting our own st strategies are going to be uh, kind of taken over, appropriated. You know how, like, like you know how uh, global capitalism, for example, appropriates the feminist language and says, "Oh, you know, buy washing machine, women's liberation, and all that." You know, so appropriation of art. Exactly. So th there's always a possibility of trivialization of the most radical political movement. But idea is to keep it going and rethink of strategies and to keep it alive. Um, you mentioned that you know, the guerrilla world had absolutely like very little to no context as to what was happening right now. So as a curatorial practice, mm -hmm. how does it make sense for them to get in when they don't have any yeah. knowledge of the social background? Was it like, you know, to put it in your face kind of a feminism which is, you know, done more often than not? Mm -hmm. Or was it, uh, I, I don't know, like how does it make sense as a curatorial practice? <laughs> yeah, certainly I would say that partly the responsibility lies with the curatorial practice where perhaps uh, it would have made the whole exchange uh, more democratic and more fruitful if, if uh, a certain sense of what's happening in this part of the world. Of course, entire blame cannot be just put on the curator. There has to be a certain interest, you know, a certain curiosity from global north. I think it works both ways, and it, and um, for example, my friend Pushpa Mala and Pushpa Mala when uh, after one of her shows in Paris, she was interviewed by a French um, uh, feminist journalist, and the kind of question that she was asked is they assume that all women are kind of so badly treated in India, and um, the, the whole idea of fem liberation is something which they are going to first put into your minds because you've never heard of before. There's such misconceptions. So when, uh, when uh, Pushpa Mala got back and said that she, she felt that, uh, you know, I think that women in your part of the world are also oppressed, she just didn't know how to take it, you know. 
there are different modes of oppression. I mean, French society is very much done through the category of beauty, physical fitness, where you have to fulfill certain male aspiration about how you should look like. You have to endure all kinds of things to fulfill that expectation. That is also certain ways in which patriarchy is exerting its control on, you, on yourself. Yeah, yeah, the uh, Bhakti movement is um, very, I mean, there are not very different ways of looking at it. Uh, sim the simplistic view is, uh, it's like, uh, for the first time, it offered a critique of the hegemonic, Brahminic uh, structure. Um, but I don't know whether today we can see it in, in those black and white terms. Um, so, they did offer uh, important ways of uh, the, the women saints, Akka Mahadevi, for example, the way in which she completely uh, questioned the shame associated with the body <coughs> hmm? uh, by renouncing clothes, being so radical that it, it com completely sh shook up the system. And uh, re recently, was it yesterday, there was a brilliant talk by my colleague H.S. Uh, Shiva Prakash, who's written a lot on Bhakti movement. And he told us something extraordinary. Uh, he gave a talk on Saundarya Lahiri, which was written in a 10th century, possibly by Shankaracharya, of course, written by a male uh, philosopher. Um, it's, a com it's, a, it's a tribute to the goddess. Every part of goddess's body is beautifully, poetically described as a way of paying homage to her. And there's no amount of shame associated with any body part, as if sacredness spreads across the entire body of the, of the goddess. Now, he raises something very interesting. He says, it was after that period that this whole attitude towards body began to shift, change. And then, I recently I've been very interested in Sanskrit aesthetics. And I was struck by, um, uh, you know, that famous author of uh, Dhanyaloka, Anandavardhana, where he uh, discusses about this problem of Auchitya. Auchitya becomes a very important problem during his time, 11th, 12th century, that, you know, when we have to describe, and poets have to describe, uh, like, erotic relationship between gods and goddesses, it's, it creates an ethical problem because, you know, gods and gods, uh, they, Shiva Parvati, they are like our parents. So, uh, to what extent can we, sh you know, show their sexual dalliance? Because we don't want to, uh, we don't want to think about our parents' uh, intimacy. You know, it's, it's as if we are doing dis disrespect to them. This question would have been unthinkable for the author of Santari Lahiri. So, there are certain shifts which are happening. You know, um, already by the time on, um, uh, the commentary on Natya Shastra by Abhinav Gupta is written, Abhinav Bharti, I have always been so taken in by his great intellectual prowess, Abhinav Gupta's you know, commentary on aesthetics. But then while reading it in the original in Sanskrit, I was so appalled when I came across his use of two categories. Um, he refers to the male connoisseur as bhogi, bhogi, who has the agency to enjoy. It can be uh, aesthetic experience, it can be sexual experience. I mean, in, in some of those texts, because he was himself a tantric, he came from Shakta tradition. Uh, these divisions are not all that important. But from feminist perspective, for me it was disturbing that he used bhogi to talk about the ability of the male uh, Kanoisa, Rasika, to have to have capacity for infinite uh, joy. But she, he said the other category is Bhogya. Women belong to the category of Bhogya, which means those who are meant to be enjoyed. And then suddenly you feel that, you know, so it's so feminism. This is a thing, scho Sanskrit scholarship largely remains in the hands of male scholars. And when I point this out to my male colleagues said, I have read Abhinava Bharti, I have never come across this. There's sudden blindness 
to the text. It's there. The text is saying it. We don't want to listen to it. So this, that kind of scholarship is also very important to shake up all these notions, you know, which we associate with the past. Well, recently I was reading a book uh, on the history of Kerala. In Kerala, even now the women are quite apart. But we told the story of mad woman who would sit in the courts, they would take part in all the discussion, and as far as their time was concerned, the breast was considered to be just like any other organ. And there was no shame associated with keeping it bare. But later on, this, uh, colonial time, yes. They began to uh, wear, it was also caste, caste issue. And the demand for wearing blouses actually came from the Naya women. It's because they were not allowed to cover their breasts, and especially if they walked in the public place, and if, even if they used to uh, carry some very thin material to cover themselves, but if a Brahmin came close to them, they're supposed to remove it. It's like you remove your hat when you're in front of a social superior. So it is that which they wanted to uh, you know, take a position against. So I think it, the whole question of what is the worst thing is also very historically determined. At what moment, what counts as radical? You know. So going back to your question, when I was, uh, I'm sure many of you must have uh, seen this wonderful uh, Ajanta frescoes. And there's one which is very, it is Mahajana Jataka, gave uh, one or two where there's a st whole story about uh, the prince who wants to, uh, Mahajana, who decides to renounce his princely world and he tells this to his young uh, bride, uh, the, the, prince, the princess. Uh, of course, she's in a state of shock. She swoons. So the whole scene of her swooning and she's held by all the, uh, the, the maid servants. And then she thinks that, no, he has to somehow you have to tempt him back into this world. So then she organizes this very, very tantalizing uh, feast uh, dance by one of the most beautiful, exquisite dancers of the court. And if you see that scene, all the rest of women, they do not wear a blouse. They are, of course, ornamented. Also in the past, if you ornamented your dress, I mean, the whole question of what, what is taken, what counts as dressed, these are culturally specific things. The only figure in that scene who covers herself with a blouse, which covers her arms, is the dancer, which makes you wonder that perhaps the clothed, covered body was seen as far more seductive, more alluring. See, it depends on what the norm is. If the norm is not to wear a blouse, then if you move away from it, that becomes more, you know, interesting. How many of us really know the context of this dress? Uh, that a breast tax was imposed. Yes. And yes. Was the first woman's yes. cut off her breast. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cut yeah. off her breast yeah. in opposition. Yeah. Yeah. So that is not remembered. Yeah. 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 That yeah. Was Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Um, so this is the current scenario where a lot of the museums and art galleries are either corporate, private funded or state funded. Yes. Um, do you think how does that play as a in some sense a restriction to um, exhibitions, curation that has mm. a feminist uh, dialogue? Because I, I don't see them actually this, anywhere. It's a huge problem because you know these days as you know there's a huge privatization of the art world as everywhere else. And I, I am always struck by how each of these private galleries, now they have a publication wing. They have enough funds to, uh, you know, uh, employ young researchers, which is a good thing, good, good thing for our students also, because they have ready employment. But the problem is, the kind of books which are coming out, are largely hagiographies, they are monographs, I, I'm not sure whether they've come across any book which writes historically and critically about some of these issues because that's not going to serve their interest. So there's generally loss of criticality, which is, I think, something which oh, I lament, but uh, something has to be done about it, which is why curatorial practices are uh, our hopes. Like, you know, you, that is one arena where you expect criticality to come up. 
Art criticism, there's no space. Look at, look at the kind of art column that you come across in newspapers. The space itself has shrunk. Hmm? So these are challenges of our times. So which is why I keep telling my students that uh, oh, as long as you are here in this university space, this is the most autonomous space. Feel free to write as critically as possible. You can't do it when you're working for a private uh, gallery. So make the most of this freedom that you have. Did you ever face any uh, very negative experience because of your gender in the past in the field uh, you are working in? Uh, well, I, for me, gender and caste come together. You know, I mean, <coughs> this is one of the, uh, how do I say it, ethical problems that I have. I am personally very uncomfortable about segregating gender because you can't, these are not neat categories that you can just, you know, plug them out. And uh, to answer that question, I would uh, perhaps answer it through the way I handled the caste question. So I was invited by Savi Savarkar uh, some years back in 2008 or 9 to uh, curate his exhibition at Lalit Kala Academy. Uh, in, in Delhi and um, so I said yes why not and apparently there was this whole buzz in the Delhi art circle art world that why is somebody with a double barreled Brahmin name has been invited to curate Savi's exhibition who, is, who always also publicly proclaimed to be the first Dalit artist. <coughs> I, I would have a lot of arguments with him I said why, why are you even using the terms, I am the first Dalit artist, doesn't it go against exactly the power structure that you have, we are all fighting for? Like me first, me first, you know? And, uh, and then I, while, while I was writing about it, of course it, it, it's a, I can, I'm open to the critique that as somebody who was born in another caste, how does it equip me to capture the experience which has been, you know, faced by somebody who belongs to another caste? But for me, these are not islands, and there are different ways of creating connectives. So for example, the question of untouchability is, can be experienced even in a Brahmin household. Like for example, my, when my mother, in, for those four days when she would, was menstruating, I was not allowed to touch her, and that's the first time I came across the idea of pollution within a Brahmin household. So these things are, in, of course, it's a different kind of experience. But it gives us, it's an analogy through which you can imagine different kinds of marginalities. Otherwise, we are locked in our own little spaces, you know. Only women can talk about women's problems. You know, only black men can talk about race. And I completely disagree with this logic of exclusive representation. The great feminist movements, you know, within the Indian art world are you know, a thing of the past, you know, and maybe something we haven't seen in recent years. Up until say, at the, it is something so forcefully projected, something with a manifesto, perhaps that the kind that came out after the whole Me Too and the Gorilla Girls event. So uh, my question would be then, what do you think is the current? Um, you know, kind of feminism that is observable in the Indian art world now? Uh, you know, I've also been very interested in Tejal Shah's, um, you know, work. And if you follow the direction that her work has taken, there was a time when she was very fiercely feminist. She, her uh, issues have always, always been, you know, changing over time. But the most current um, obsession or interest is ecology. So, uh, it's very interesting that, I, I don't see contradiction, because if you expand the feminist concern, it does raise this question about how do you take care of the planet, you know. So, it's, and I think the time of that kind of a strident feminism, where you could see it as an isolated category, today is very difficult for us to give it that kind of a prominence, you know, because it's all interwoven. So we have to see it in its larger, you know, how it's 
uh, in larger networks of power. for women artists to um, you know, either have, say, a, a show in uh, something like the NGMA, for example, or a private gallery. But I see a link, you know, economics and uh, sometimes even the critical study of women artists as a big link that goes on. What are your thoughts on this? Again, I mean, I feel that, uh, unfortunately, our state art institutions are um, fading away in importance, unfortunately. It's something to be lamented. And uh, no matter, I mean, I, I'm so critical of what's happening in terms of privatization of the art world, but it's in some of those private art galleries that very exciting shows are happening. So this is again a problem because they have the resources, the means um, of, <coughs> of uh, you know, mounting interesting shows. Um, and I don't know about Bombay, but in Delhi, uh, the kind of exhibitions which are being shown at NGMA, we, I don't know if you've <laughs> read about the sordid event which happened where NGMA was used as a, uh, as, as a forum, as an arena by the Prime Minister to auction all the gifts that he had received as a way of raising funds and something like that it, I find it deeply distressing you know um, it cannot be used as this kind of political platform by, by, by these leaders these spaces have to enjoy certain autonomy for the same reason I would say JNU right now we are facing a lot of problems for us it's a question of survival our own autonomy is being challenged under, I mean, we are all accused of being anti-national, and that's the best way of bashing up institutions and to rob them of their autonomy. The reason why we are blacklisted is because, you know, um, uh, we are happy to teach our students that you, you have to question anything, any, you question us as well. You know, you have to question the, uh, those who are in power, and nobody's under, you know, below that 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 threshold. And this is for that reason, uh, I think institutional spaces are losing the autonomy. That way, situation in Mumbai is uh, quite better. Uh, you just told the example of NGM. Mm -hmm. But here, I think because of, I don't know, because of people or whatever, mm -hmm. but, but the institutions here have maintained that autonomy. Uh, Do you foresee a bleak future, or uh, do you have a solution? How do we come off it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, see, uh, despondency, bleakness. They, I think, they're not good for politics. <laughs> you have to, uh, even if one is utopian, what it's very important to imagine that change is possible. Otherwise, your your battle is half lost if you have that kind of pessimism. So I'm sure there's a possibility of uh, creating critical spaces through our own practices, in our own ways. And uh, social media is such an important platform. I know, I know social media is a double-edged. Uh, technology itself is double-edged. You can either use it or you know, uh, misuse it. But there are ways of intervening and uh, creating um, important solidarities, networks. But there are people who are paying price for that. Take the case of Atishi, the Aadmi Party candidate, who is a tremendous woman who has done really brilliant work in the field. And the way she is being uh, scandalized, it's very sad. And uh, I mean, she uh, imagine what must be going through her mind. She yesterday wept in the speech. I know, but you know, I, I'm still very hopeful and very optimistic about the Indian electorate. You know that they. You know, they are, they are capable of 
giving us surprises. So, I'm being optimistic maybe, <laughs> but pessimism is not a good, good uh, policy or good politics. <laughs> What, according to you, leads to the difference between the art scene in India and the art scene out of India? Mm. <coughs> well, you raise a huge question. Um, but you know, we are also li living in a kind of a globalizing world where even nation states are becoming less important in terms of uh, the, 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 the freedom with which artists are traveling, artworks are traveling, ideas, information travel. Uh, it's the whole question. That's why I, I in fact, Anita Dubey came up with that very interesting statement that we are living in a world where uh, everything is mixed up in a state of mess. So today it's very hard for us to create this sharp demarcation between world out there and us. I know there is there are the certain constituencies there is something called Global North in terms of the kind of power privilege that is enjoyed by that sphere and there is something called Global South. Of course, they are, these are contested uh, terms of distinction but we are living in a world which is very unequal and we have to uh, make those inequalities visible. I think that's part of one's political project. Um, but there's, despite that, there's always a possibility of of a dialogue and um, the, my, because you know I've been interested in global art history and I've been writing about it and for a long time I was I became very comfortable in the space of what, what we understand as the post-colonial critique you know you can go to n number of global conferences and you can go on critiquing Eurocentricism and then after some time I realized this is too easy you know, it's too easy. And because people out there, if you want to provoke them, and they actually look at you and they say things like, you know, you, sp you speak so well. Where, where, do you, where do you learn how to speak so well? I mean, it's, it's so condescending that it can lead to it, your, its own frustration. So I feel that more challenging task, which I want to involve myself into, is doing the hard work of writing histories critical histories and that is the hard work which needs to be done. It can't be just done by one individual. It has to be kind of collective endeavor. It needs to be done. Can I ask one more question? Uh, you see, uh, my question relates to art and nature. Okay, you see, art is uh, such an important tool. Thousands of years back when we did not have language, then also we had art. People made something on the wall, art and storytelling. And this is something through which you can send your message across without saying anything. And if we come to nature, the nature has also been deteriorated by mankind. So I personally have stopped believing in the notion of nationality or your countryness. For me, earth is my country or universe is my country. So anybody who is harming that universe is my enemy, whether he is Indian or foreigner or whatever. Okay. So how do you think art can use itself to, to, to reach that powerful position here? It can convey this to uh, humankind as a whole that you see environment is very precious to us and it is time we should uh, think about it. See, what, what, you, what you just said now, it sort of fits in with the idea of I mean, a lot of artists would like to imagine themselves as global citizens, you know. It can be very, uh, it can be very liberating to have that model for yourself. But then there's also a question of your own location, uh, which I one can't ignore, you know. Can I, can I just <laughs> add one? Sorry for interrupting. Recently, I was... Uh, on deputation to election commission. I work in uh, some other government department. And there I had to work with uh, some people who were who had Marathi speaking this, Marathi language. And there also I found that a sort of dubism was created between Marathi and non-Marathis. And when I requested them to explain something in Hindi or English, then they said, why don't you learn Marathi? So I felt like 
you can create differences anywhere, whether you are in India or in Maharashtra or in Mumbai or in anywhere. So it's useless to uh, think in terms of nationality or whatever. You just remain human, that's the most important thing. Yeah, but then, I mean, human is such an abstract category, you know. We are also this whole question of belonging is also important. You can't shrug off the responsibility um, of being part of a particular identity. I mean, maybe artists have certain freedom after you perhaps, you know, arrived at a certain point in your career. You feel that now you can exercise that freedom to announce or renounce your own location, your own national identity, which you think is too uh, limiting. Uh, but at the same time, they also have to, they're part of this world. They're also involved in its own problems. Vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, they have to also take certain position, right, in terms of certain com commitment that you have towards the world that you're part of. So that is also there. Um, yeah. But I was wondering, like this artwork, for example, to me a lot of them seem very spectacular in that sense because they encourage you to photograph yourself against this using this as a background. So I was wondering uh, if you could just uh, respond to that. See, a spectacle, uh, it, you can use spectacle in different ways, you know. And I still remember, uh, was it one of the earlier Venice Biennales? I don't remember which year, 20, 11 or 13 where India had its first pavilion. Hmm? Had the first pavilion. Rajit Hoskote was the curator who was in charge of that India pavilion. And at that time, I, uh, I was not able to travel because of some Schengen visa problem. So I had two friends visiting. So I told them, uh, please make sure that you, know, you see the India pavilion very, very closely and you must come back to me and tell me. So one was Sonal Kular. She is, um, has published a lot now. She teaches in Washington University. Mm -hmm. And the other one was, of course, from Goldsmiths College, Eric Drogoff, uh, very important theorist. And I had two such disparate takes on the India Pavilion of Venice Biennale. Sonal Kular tells me, of course, she teaches in the US, but she grew up in India. She's very much connected with the discourses here. She said, oh my God, that was the most powerful curatorial framework that she's ever come across. And uh, she was completely bowled over. And the subtlety of the framing is that. And then I meet Irit Drogoff, a very important theorist. She says, it was a missed opportunity. Because she said she almost was on the point of not seeing it because according to her, it was uh, the space which was given to India Pavilion, it seemed like a space in between two major pavilions. So a lot of people missed it. They, they took it as a transit to move from one to the other. And so then it struck me, of course, this whole difference between culture inside and outsider. She is a very renowned, uh, critical theorist, but perhaps she did not quite, she's not familiar with certain critical discourse, question of nationalism, issues that are ailing this part of the world, which Ranjit Hoskut was addressing. And so she completely missed it. Then I, I thought that actually spectacle is not a bad thing. So you can use spectacle to be able to grab the attention, because if you go to any Venice Biennale, it's very hard to completely turn your, you know, eyes from it, or you know, take a position against it, because that's the space of spectacle. Biennale, whether you like it or not, but for me, you can use it as a, as as a as a carefully thought out strategy to make your most subtle ideas visible. You know what I mean? So there are ways of inhabiting spectacle. So, uh, spectacle by itself can't be just denounced. You, the world of art, you deal with visuality, vision. And in art history, there's always been a major 
war between the realm of the words and the realm of images. Long battle, you know. And sometimes artists, um, they feel that uh, those who place too much of importance on words, they're not engaging with the visual element and vice versa. It's, it's a long kind of a battle. But spectacle has a role to play, I would say. But the kind of spectacle that Gideva was talking about, it's a, it's a spectacle which dulls you, which brings out the most, uh, you know, uncritical sight in you, you know, which is what fits in with the logic of capitalism itself. Capitalism doesn't allow that kind of criticality, because otherwise it cannot function. If you start raising those questions, it cannot function. So do you think in a way it's been reappropriated, just the concept of the spectacle itself? I mean, especially uh, the way that you were speaking. Yeah, perhaps that's a good example yeah. of the use of the spectacular in a way which, uh, through which it becomes a vehicle for something which is a very serious, important narrative. That's precisely what Anita Dubey was talking about. How to bring together pedagogy and pleasure, you know. And that's why, I, towards the end, I said that when you come across works of this kind, and that's when the curatorial intervention comes to the foreground and the kind of slightly disturbing heaviness kind of lifts up because you find that the two things coming together. Shall you wind up? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.